All right. We're supposed to start this walk at 12, but it's 12.15. Um, but I think we finally have the camera acting correctly and um, staying horizontally centered as it's supposed to. And so we're gonna start once again. Um, this is our Earth first of two here in Eugene Springfield Earth Day tree walks. And this one, we're starting looking at this lovely Hungarian oak. It's called Forest Green Cultivar of Hungarian Oak. And um, it's a beautiful uh, tree for our area. It's being used more and more. Very um, tough, very climate adapted, very drought tolerant. Um, we think it's a great tree for the future. It does have, we, can, we saw the one to the east died of these two that were planted. We think there's a graft incompatibility issue. That's one thing that needs to be resolved by the growers before this becomes more of a useful tree. We're gonna start now and talk briefly about Oregon white oak. That's a, a beautiful columnar, um, very upright Oregon white oak here that Friends of Trees planted maybe eight, 10, 12 years ago. I'm not sure how long ago, but really nice tree. Oregon white oak really is the classic tree of, and we'll go into the sun here a little bit just to warm up and look at this beauty of an Oregon white oak. Again, planted eight to 12 years ago. I'm not sure how long ago by Friends of Trees. We've been out, I think volunteers came and pruned these trees twice um, to help maintain their form and get, um, prune them up for clearance and structure. Um, very, very, very drought tolerant tree. Its leaves are really leathery, which helps um, them not lose moisture. Um, they get these really thick trunks like this when they're young, really working on setting themselves up for a long-term future in their area. They can live two, three, four, five hundred years sometimes. Very long-lived deciduous oak. Most of the oaks, like we talked about, um, are wind-pollinated. Like we talked about these hornbeams across the way being wind-pollinated. Look at this beautiful freshly leafed out entire block long row of European hornbeams. And we'll take a look back at this Oregon white oak. So when um, people do restoration work to try and restore a landscape that's been damaged in the Willamette Valley, they typically restore to a point right when early settlers were coming into this area um, and the indigenous people had been here maybe 13 to 16,000 years. Um, and during that time period, the climate changed really dramatically. The last of the ice, the most recent ice age of the Pleistocene, it's called the Wisconsin glaciation. It lasted from about 100 and, 110, 115,000 years ago till about 10,000 years ago. And that's very, very uh, typical for the Pleistocene era, which we are still in, despite what many say. Um, the Pleistocene era is the era of ice ages and large animals. And during that time, we've had about 25 uh, long ice ages um, that are about 190 or 100,000 years old, 100,000 years long. And then in between each of them is about a 10,000 year warm period called an interglaciation. And then within those long ice ages and long war warm periods, there's warmer and colder periods um, called stadials, which is just a shorter ice age or a shorter interglacial period. And there's um, a whole bunch of these different patterns all happening at once. Um, during the last warm period, about the uh, well, we're in what's called the Holocene, which is a 10,000 year um, interlude between ice ages. The, the last one of these 10,000 year warm periods was called the Eemian from about 110 to 120,000 years ago. And the, this warm period peaked, the ice age ended around 10 to 12,000 years ago. And then it got really, really hot. So hot that it changed uh, the forests that were in our area 
from um, ponderosa pine, spruce, really cold um, on the edge of tundra kind of forests, changed to oak savanna. And this is with, we think, without humans adding burning and all of that, and it was just naturally got that warm and it peaked in warmth about 9,000 to 7,000 years ago. And during that time period, there would have been so much heat and uh, fires related to that without humans even setting them that oaks became much, much more prevalent and became the dominant tree in the landscape. Starting five to 7,000 years ago, the earth began to cool very, very gradually and has been cooling towards our next 100,000 year ice age. Ever since then, until industrial humans started cranking out enormous amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And um, as we did that, starting around 150, 200 years ago, it started to become significant. And that gradually started to reverse the cooling effect of the Pleistocene, which is driven by three massive astrogeophysical cycles that um, working together are called the Milankovitch cycle. And that's what drives climate in a really big way is this giant cycles, these three giant cycles related to the movement of the earth through the cosmos, how the sun is hitting it how it's tilting, how it's wobbling, cur curvature of the earth, and the amount of sunlight that reaches the earth because of that. Again, those horn beams across the way. And so, um, but as the earth began to cool, Doug Fir would have taken over almost all the landscape if the indigenous people didn't start burning and burning the entire Willamette Valley probably for much of the last five to 7,000 years almost every year to keep Doug Furs from taking over because grasslands are where hunter-gatherers get their food. There's almost nothing to eat other than the inner bark of trees, which is, is edible, but it's a survival food. And uh, in conifer forests, there's very little for a hunter-gatherer to eat. There's much less deer and elk than in a grassland and um, really not many, not many desirable plant foods except fungus. So native people, um, uh, hunter-gatherer people, burn the Willamette Valleys to, to maintain those oak savanna grassland systems of which there are more than two million acres in the Willamette Valley. And they, they did that um, very regularly until that was disrupted by colonization and the introduction of diseases that radically disrupted their culture and, and their forced removal to the Siletz and Grand Ronde reservations in the Oregon coast range. Um, when the fires were stopped, um, white settlers introduced hogs and, and wheat farming, um, which radically changed the landscape. And in the area where they weren't doing that, dug fur rapidly spread over the landscape. And so a lot of the times when we're trying to go back and, and do restoration, we're doing it to a, a culturally managed landscape, but not to what nature would do if we weren't here. If humans weren't here, Doug Fir would take over almost every bit of land surface of the Willamette Valley, except for the active floodplain, wetlands like out in West Eugene and Southwest facing hillsides. But we'll see in our walk this afternoon the times are really changing and we're going back towards that naturally occurring oak savanna. Our, our temperatures are going back towards the what allowed the oak savanna to develop. Oregon white oak is a fabulous tree. Here's another beauty. Friends of Trees planted about 10-12 years ago. Um, Oregon white oak is one of the best habitat trees. It's wind pollinated, so not as advantageous to pollinators as some. But uh, if you look really carefully at older trees, if you go up into the upper part of this tree, you can start to see some of the epiphytes on, on the tree, which are lichens, mosses, and liverworts, among, among others. There's um, parasites like, the, like mistletoe are very common in older trees. Um, 
and uh, mistletoe produces uh, berries that are edible to birds and the um, really cool things that uh, I doubt we'll see on these these young ones here but are um, galls which wasps lay um, inject a, a chemical and an egg into the leaves of the oak trees that cause them to grow a little home for their babies um, and we'll look for some of those today um, but these are Oregon white oaks I'm gonna move down and just have to take one more look. This is just such a pretty whole block of European horn beams. I'll bet the fall color there is really nice too. Um, this tree is a little Oregon ash, Friends of Trees planted. And for the first five years, it just looked terrible. It was covered in aphids and spindly, had a really hard time growing. We kept pruning it, watering it, mulching it. And it's finally taken off and is looking really healthy now. It's really nice to see that. We're going to work our way on this walk and I'm going to stop at the next tree here and um, remind you all again that it's this is our first of two um, for your Eugene Springfield chapter of Friends of Trees Earth Day walks on this Earth Day 2021. Um, this is another kind of oak and I love these oaks um, I was looking at Schumard oaks and when they leaf out their leaves are so yellowy really a pale pale yellow green very very pretty um, and we're gonna just zoom up because I want to look look at the nice straight trunk that was gotten on on this oak this oak got um, topped and did not have a central leader. And one of uh, my old tree mentors, uh, Whitey Lewick, did some pruning work and some staking and was able to get a really nice form back on that oak. I'm not sure have to, what kind of oak that is, whether it's a scarlet oak, kind of looks like a scarlet oak. There's another one there. We're gonna work walk down the street because I want to show you know, I'll go and buy a couple golden desert ashes on the left here we're under power lines um, golden desert ash is a tree that we can plant under power lines it's one of the only ash species that we're we can plant now because of worries of emerald ash borer coming to our area but we're gonna go up and look at one of the trees that's just in full bloom in our community now not a great tree for climate change, but it is so pretty that um, we've just got to just take a look at it. So good for pollinators. And look at how many blooms are on this. This tree's also, to me, is a very, very special tree because I helped plant this tree years ago and it has been vandalized repeatedly. It's been hit by cars multiple times. Uh, I, I had no no thought that this tree could survive all the things that have happened to it and live and just incredibly thrive. It looks so good, so healthy. It's just covered in blooms. The smell is almost overpowering, almost like maple maple syrup. Uh, I don't know how I describe the smell, but just full of these blossoms. This is. Uh, kind of Canada red choke cherry, so it's in the rose family, and you can see those very rose looking blossoms with lots of stamens. There, you kind of the yellow inside, and uh, the white flowers um, in these. Not sure what this, this flower cluster is called if it's a raceme or um, a spike, I forget what it's called, but um, really, really pretty. And you can see some honeybees up there and some other pollinators working on it. Um, there's that weird fungus thing. I don't know if you can see it up there on the branch. Let's see if I can get a little closer to it. I don't know what that is. We were looking at that, um, I think, in one of Taylor's tree walks. 
Well, I really just wanted to show you that Canada Red choke cherry, and we're going to move on and start talking about some of the trees we're experimenting with for climate change. We're one of the the main predictions of climate change for our area is that it's going to we're going to have hotter, drier summers and warmer, slightly moister winters. There'll be less snowpack in the mountains. We'll have uh, much hotter summers and the dry season which we already have a Mediterranean climate with an annual summer drought. The drought used to extend from about mid-June to mid-September. And um, one of the climate change predictions is for um, increasing uh, length of that summer dry period. So instead of mid-June to mid-September, now it's already uh, mid-May to mid-October. But we're becoming more and more kind of like Central California. And we're expected to become like Sacramento was 20 years ago in about 20 years. Um, so kind of like the Central Valley of California. Because of that, um, one thing that we're trying to do is plant some of the trees from Sacramento area. And some of the trees that thrive just to the south of us. And even looking at considering... Um, planting acorns or strains of trees that grow here like Oregon white oak or Valley Ponderosa pine that are from a little bit south of here. This is a true California black oak, one of our, um, the only other native oak to Eugene area currently, um, Oregon white, it, the one we looked at before. And you can see Oregon white oak is in the white oak group. California black oak is in the red oak group. White oaks have rounded lobes, so the tips of their leaves are rounded, and you can see these are pointy, like um, a tree that's in the red oak group. Red oaks grow a little bit faster, are a little shorter lived, and they, um, their acorns often mature differently than the white oak group. Sometimes um, one of them will mature in one year and one over two years. Um, very beautiful tree and you can see that it has a different kind of climate adaptation than Oregon white oak. This is a very drought tolerant tree too but it doesn't have, its leaves aren't as leathery. Um, they're much more glossy and thin and so um, I'm not quite sure what all its climate adaptations are um, but it's very drought tolerant, grows in, in a lot of really dry conditions in California. It has this really uh, pretty, especially when they're very young or you go out towards the the branch tips and the stems are very very chocolatey really pretty smooth bark on these um, and then we're going to look at one of the most drought tolerant oaks in the world and this is one of I think it covers the most land area in California of any oak very common in California you, when you um, drive down I-5. I used to drive down I-5 and go on hiking trips every spring break when I was in college and I would love seeing the western red bud in full bloom in late March in between the lanes of I-5 and then when you get to the Central Valley and you hit Redding and you get down past Weed and um, hit the Sacramento Valley and it opens up and you can just see these rolling oak savanna hills and those are these blue oaks. Um, it's named after David Douglas, so it's Quercus for the oaks, and Douglas Quercus Gariana um, is the Oregon white oak, and Quercus Douglasii is this one, the blue oak. The leaves are just coming out, just starting to leaf out, and you can kind of see if you go up close that uh, these leaves are very hairy. Um, which is an adaptation to avoid uh, water loss. They're, they're smaller. Um, these become very leathery like the Oregon white oak and they develop a blue gray uh, tint to them, um, which is another drought adaptation. There's another one across the street. You can uh, see coming up over that pickup there. Another one here. These are some of the earliest ones we planted. These ones have really struggled to do well but they're just now starting to take off. Um, this one has a very long drick sticks stick on it. Um, these are one of our, um, we use these to prevent 
weed eaters and mowers from hitting the base as well as vandals from snapping the trunk and they, they really seem to help us us with that. They're named after a, a wonderful neighborhood activist named the single name of Drix. And then here's this beautiful ash. Looks like a green ash here. Um, and I wanted to go this way to look at those blue oaks, but I also wanted to see this ginkgo. It has this really nice straight, straight trunk really pretty form I think um, very nice ginkgo and now we're gonna um, kind of zip along a block down the street past a couple sweet gums and head to this little park on the corner of 14th and Hilliard we're gonna go just a few blocks down to the old Bijou theater on um, 13th and Ferry where we're gonna end the walk and here on Hilliard Street We'll look at a, a couple trees as we work our way. If you look down the street, I don't know if you can see it down there, but there's a bunch of those um, Prunus virginiana, the Canada Red choke cherries down there, and um, we're just waiting to cross this very busy intersection. Um, if you look diagonally across the street, you can see a tree there. Um, that is a uh, London plane tree. People typically call them sycamores. It's a cross between the eastern sycamore and the oriental plane tree. It was made way back in the 1600s. Um, this tree is doing really, really well now. Nice to see it. We probably planted, they can get that big in four or five years. We probably planted this one 15 years ago. It was vandalized three or four times, hit by cars a couple times. We've cut it to the base and pruned it back into a tree and it finally got past all the vandalism and is gonna make it and is a big beautiful tree. We'll go by these um, really wild looking, I think they're, oh, I thought they were amber maples, but they look like, um, whatever you call it, snow, snow bell, snow bush. Um, not Japanese snow bell, but a, a different one. I wanted to go this way too just to look. You don't see these anymore. I think they've been removed from the city's um, approved street tree list. All over Scandinavia there's different um, versions of the sorbus that are planted or mountain ash. Um, we call it a, a mountain ash because the le leaves are pinnately compound so it's this one leaf here with a lot of leaflets and which is very much like ash. However, if you look at the flowers, and they are really powerfully smelling. Oh, it's almost too much for me. Um, that is a sorbus or mountain ash. And here's a real ash. So you can see the leaf shape is very similar. They have these, again, a, a leaflet with, mul uh, a leaf with multiple leaflets. However, ash is in the ash family or the olive family, the oleaceae and the mountain ash is in the rose family, the rosaceae. So very, very different, uh, not really related. Here's an Oregon white oak that um, Friends of Trees helped plant and maintain for a little while, but it sure could have used some more pruning to get it uh, a better form here. But it's, it's taken off, doing well. Um, this is a, a really sweet park. Um, it's one of the, the first park I know of that was planted all to natives was Monroe Park. This park here is uh, full of natives. It's, um, and they're, it's really starting to look nice. They've finally gotten big enough and taken off enough. You can see, you know, some common ones like tall Oregon grape, which I've been seeing a lot of hummingbirds coming to. You can see over here, vine maple. In the foreground, this is about 15 foot tall tree. And in the background, a young big leaf maple coming up in full, full bloom. I'd encourage you to check out our Facebook page and look at the video that our staff member Becca made on big leaf maples, really sweet video. And she talks about how you can eat those flowers at the right time. Um, and then over here, 
are a couple cascara trees. And we'll come up and take a, a look at their leaves. At the stem, uh, there's a ladybug on the, on the trunk. Um, and here's a bigger one. Cascara is um, in the Ramnaceae, the buckthorn family. Um, and uh, look at the beautiful trunk and, and branching and form on this cascara. Um, Ramnus persiana, um, it, it's medicine uh, used traditionally in herbology, uh, I think as an emetic, um, but basically to uh, a pur purgator, a pur purgative. Um, and here's a really pretty Oregon white oak. So, so nice the way they planted this park full of natives. And then um, just an amazing like little cluster of natives around here. I don't know if you can see all this milkweed. This is, um, we have four native milkweeds. This is one called Asclepius speciosa or common milkweed around here. Um, these, you can see their flower, flower buds forming. They come up real late. Milkweed does, um, real easy to grow from seed. Anyone can grow as easy as almost any garden plant. Um, they have incredibly beautiful, fragrant flowers. Um, it's the only, it's, it's the only genus that the monarch butterfly overwinters on and um, lays its eggs and has its babies. So um, the monarchs are dying off all around um, the western migration and the eastern migration. The western migration of monarchs is particularly threatened. And so wherever we can plant these milkweeds, it really helps. Um, this uh, plant growing next to it, very beautiful plant, um, is in the hibiscus family, a native plant called Sedalsia. Um, very, very pretty, and then some native wetland plants. And then my favorite here, don't want to touch the those hairy stems too, too closely. Um, it can give you severe dermatitis. Actually, if you touch that and your skin is exposed to the sun, it can mutate your skin and cause the DNA to change. Um, however, the native people figured that they figured out how to peel off that skin and that underneath it's edible. You do not want to try eating this unless you really know what you're doing because um, three of our deadliest plants in North America look a fair amount like this. Water hemlock, the deadliest one in North America, looks a lot like it. And then um, poison hemlock that Socrates did himself in with grows in our alleys, ditches, roadways around here. And that is also in the, the carrot family or the umbelliferae and looks enough like it that I, I know of two people who have eaten it and um, nearly killed themselves. Um, it, it destroys your liver really fast. Um, you can see the camas here in the park in full bloom. Lots more wetland plants, ferns, vine maple. Just a really sweet park. The, the trees that are really climate resilient though in this park are not, um, well the milkweed was, but not so much big leaf maple, vine maple, or cascara, but those Oregon white oaks, like that beautiful one in the circle there, and um, this incense cedar. So we'll, we'll take a look at these at the walk this afternoon, um, that go, uh, meeting at 3 o'clock at the top of Spencer Butte. Um, but our, our so-called cedar, really in the cypress family, um, has these uh, really attractive segmented scales, is how, how I tell um, incense cedar apart. Its bark's also very different from our other so-called cedars, like western red cedar or port orford cedar. Now we're getting in to the thick. We'll leave the park here. And, uh, oh, well, we gotta take a look at these trilliums blooming. But a lot of myths about how sensitive trilliums are and how if you pick one, it won't bloom for seven years. I, none of that's true. Um, but they are just stunningly beautiful, uh, much tougher than people think, easier to grow in the garden. Um, beautiful, beautiful um, native lily. There's um, several different species. And um, this is a different species of that hibiscus 
family plant, the Sedalcia or checker mallow. Um, there's two species, I think, growing in this park. Now we're going to take a look at, you know, how I was talking about for climate change, we're planting trees that are from uh, south of here and including some of our really drought tolerant California trees. This is a prime example. This is valley oak. This is the main oak of the Central Valley, the valley floor. If you um, ever have a chance to go camping along the Sacramento River, um, if you're working your way down from like Redding down to the Bay Area, you'll see these trees along the river. Um, I, the biggest ones of these I've ever seen. Um, most of the oaks, most of the landscapes of California have been destroyed and converted to um, agricultural production or cities and or, or logging up in the mountains. Um, so there's not many of the oak habitats left. And some of the best remaining examples are military bases. The Hunter Leggett Military Base in the Central California coast near Big Sur probably has the best example of these. There's eight 10 foot diameter valley oaks throughout the military base there. Um, valley oak becomes bigger than any oak on earth. This is the big, biggest oak that there can be. Uh, Quercus lobata, another in the white oak group. And they do incredibly well here. You would not want to plant one unless, like here, it has a nine foot or greater planting strip. We won't plant these because um, this one will gr grow for hundreds of years and get just ast astronomically large. Um, here's a Another one here, both of these were vandalized. We cut them to the base and grew them back. Let's see if we can see, yeah, you can see here at the base of this tree. Right there is where the, the tree originally trunk was. It was vandalized, we cut it to the base and grew it back from the, um, we're back from the roots and it's looking great now it's almost big enough to be past vandalism but now we're gonna look at a potential <laughs> problem and I just look at these and just burst out laughing um, so in the red oak group is a tree are, are uh, a series of trees that are broadleaf evergreens that is their oaks um, but they they keep their leaf, keep most of their leaves through the winter and are evergreen like this inside cedar beside us is an evergreen tree uh, it's a really nice one this is an ever a broadleaf evergreen so this is a conifer in that it produces cones as its seeds fruits and these produce acorns as their seeds and fruits and they're broadleaf evergreens. They're in the red oak group. Red oak group, as I mentioned, grows really fast. And um, these ones, though, growing too fast. I mean, this is, we've pruned this probably three, three times or more, and it's just the biggest tangle and explosive growth thing. Like, I wouldn't even know where to start pruning this at this point. We're gonna come through and try soon try and get this a little um, bring the branches in towards the center and try and get it growing up a little more um, the good thing about evergreens uh, is that they and let's take a look at this this is a tree we planted maybe seven or eight years ago look at the diameter on this thing I mean it's about eight inches in diameter and look up into the into the canopy so these are great for creating shade in really hot areas um, they're great the the advantage of evergreens over deciduous trees in our area is that they're much better for stormwater infiltration so that is when it rains in the winter time instead of uh, the water going through just the skeleton of a deciduous tree and most of it landing on the ground or 
uh, worst case on the road surface where then it uh, scours all the pollution off the roads, all our radiator fluid and brake linings, creosote coming off our power poles, um, all the just garbage from our, our way of life on the streets gets flushed straight into our streams by rainfall. And these guys move it into the soil instead where it gets filtered quite a bit and bacteria help break down some of the pollutants. So um, trees like this are much better for stormwater. Um, these are great habitat trees because they provide all the acorns for birds, squirrels, and deer, and all the different for humans. Acorns are a really important, very nutritious food. Um, as we move south, our um, and we go to drier locations. We'll look at another one across the street, another of these. These are interior live oaks, Quercus wislazinii. And um, we'll also look at some canyon live oaks and some coast live oaks. But uh, as you move south, you go through vegetation belts. And so we're in the, the boreal forest and as you go north, it changes from Doug fir dominated to Western Red Cedar dominated or Sitka Spruce or um, Lodgepole Pine dominated as you get colder and cooler. As you go south, you change from the, the boreal conifer forest type to a um, sclerophyllous or broadleaf evergreen forest. So a forest composed of trees like this, Madrone, um, Toyon and um, other trees that are broadleaf evergreen. Then you get into chaparral, and chaparral goes to grassland. And so in California, the lands that are chaparral are changing to grassland, and the ones that are broadleaf evergreen forests with trees like these are changing to chaparral. And then our, our forests. We expect a lot of our conifer forests to burn down and trees like this to move north quickly. Um, however, we, we just have to see what happens. We'll go take a look at this other just tangle of dense growth. These trees are growing so fast, doing so well. They love it here. This is easier growing. You know, they often grow in really rocky, dry, Central California sites. Um, you can see we prune this for years. And um, one of the interesting things about live oaks is that, um, I, let's see if we can see, their, er, their younger and lower leaves tend to be pointed and sharp, trying to discourage deer from eating them. And their upper leaves, as they go higher up, are rounded and smooth. Where they don't have to worry about that and they have these really pretty um, kind of like the California black oaks chocolatey smooth trunks they're just amazing um, the issue we're worried about with them is how they hold up in ice storm because there's just so much canopy surface um, there to catch the weight and so we're trying to learn to grow them so they're more upright, plant really upright ones and then prune them so they maintain that upright form. Um, now we're gonna just quickly zip over to our final spot, take a look at a couple things along the way. First one I wanna look at, this poor tree's been replanted twice or three times because it's been vandalized. Um, one uh, the person living in the apartment there, a mother and daughter, uh, actually witnessed a pack of drunk girls take a, the tree that a pack of young boys had ripped out of the ground and thrown uh, to the south there, and the girls came and threw it over against the door. Um, but we just keep replanting it, and uh, eventually it'll, it won't get noticed, and won't get vandalized, and it'll get big. This is a beautiful, beautiful tree. I love this tree. It has very, very corky bark. This is a super good tree for climate change. It's from the Mediterranean. 
Um, it's called Turkish Hazel or Turkish Filbert. It's uh, a hazel like our, our native hazel or the production food hazel. It does produce a small amount of, of nuts. This is the biggest hazel of all the hazels on earth. It gets, I could get to 60 or 100 feet and has that very quirky bark, very, very drought tolerant, used to a climate like ours, does really well here, has really strong, uh, this isn't the, the best example, but it has these really nice branch angles like this, uh, nicely spaced branching, and um, a really pyramidal upright form, beautiful, beautiful fall color, really nice tree. Now we're gonna head down the street. I love my favorite uh, of the hawthorns that we plant. We're not allowed to plant the native hawthorn. Um, and the only one I've been able to, to get the city to let us plant is Laval hawthorn. Hawthorns have thorns, so they're real challenged to, to allow. Our native one has inch long thorns, so I understand why. Um, and we planted thousands of English hawthorns that look terrible around our city. Um, these are some kind of funky looking, but beautiful Lavelle hawthorns over there. Another tree for climate change, it's, it's a hybrid of Mexican hawthorn, which gives, us, gives it incredible drought tolerance. It keeps its leaves, its fall color, which is spectacular, peaks around Thanksgiving and goes into December sometimes. It keeps its leaves very, very late, and um, there, its leaves are a deep, rich green. Um, not too common um, with the hawthorns. Uh, here's a big leaf maple. We're gonna move on. Oh, there's another Turkish hazel, a bigger, healthier one over here that we can take a quick look at as we move around the corner. And yeah, this Turkish hazel is about two or three years, about two years older than that other one that was planted at the same time but had to get replanted twice. Again, you can see it's really quirky bark pretty leaves and the leaves have all kinds of color on them even now in the fall they turn just brilliant and another young Turkish hazel so lots of trees we're experimenting with for climate change you can see a dying birch up there soon to be removed and a catalpa just starting to leaf out one of my favorite trees you can see it's just covered in bean pods Across the street was the biggest catalpa in town. Um, it survived uh, an axe attack and all kinds of things, but really uh, you can see that apartment building over there um, when it was built damaged the roots and so it ended up failing in a storm. Here's another of our evergreen oaks. This one isn't quite, doesn't have quite as wild of a canopy shape and this one has some really noticeable it's it's in full bloom and so you can look up and see see these catkins the the, the flowers these are the male flowers and they also have um, female flowers on the same tree that um, ideally the male flowers come out earlier on some trees than other trees and so they put out the pollen and um, the female flowers on the same tree will come out later after these guys are done so they'll get pollinated by other trees and that's a strategy to avoid inbreeding that um, trees figured out you can see really like every branch some of these branches grew six feet last year um, very fast growing very healthy loves it here more of these incense cedars that came in on their own doing really really well there's so much to look at in this neighborhood. So many trees, so much going on. Look at that beautiful big leaf maple there. Just finishing up. It's growing, it's uh, flowering. And we're gonna look at a couple trees over here and then go down and end the walk at the end of that block. Um, I talked about, we should, looked at the example of the tree we cut to the base that had grown back 
and uh, here's two trees same thing here's one of the California black oaks we talked about this was growing really well and um, had the top snapped out on it and so you can see here's a strategy to try and get a, a central leader again is to make a stub cut and then tie that branch to it this will become a central leader again prune the other parts back you can look down at the base this one was actually just vandalized on top and this one over here was vandalized at the base this is another one of those blue oaks you can see they have those short leaves that's just leafing out there's a little bit of the bluish gray color in them now but they become more and more like that as they mature and down at the base of this one you can see at the base of our um, arbor guard here you see this right here let's see if I can change the lighting a little bit and get over on this side and this is the old trunk of the tree cut it to the base sent up root sprouts like this and we managed it down to this one which now is a little seven foot tall tree it's just got to go a couple more years and it will be healthy and past the vandalism stage it'll be too big and strong so we're gonna go end our walk now around the corner at the first blue oak that friends of trees planted gosh maybe eight years ago it's looking phenomenal a couple trees here that that's the northern red oak just leafing out and this tree is always amazing to me. Uh, it looks like a green ash. It was band uh, it was attacked by there's some party dudes in this house here, and they chopped with an at hatchet. You, you can see here this was almost entirely girdled. Comes all the way around there, and just hacked apart this with the hatchet all the way down through here. <laughs> All the way to here so there's only this part here right about there that was still living um, and somehow the tree um, calloused over that wound it's just amazing to me you can see it's trying to close off you can see the last rem remains of the hatchet stuff in there and it's even trying to close that off with this massive callus and it's a big healthy tree Trees are really amazing and impressive. I'm going to take a quick look at this coast live oak. And this is, is one we haven't seen. Another of the California central, central coast, central California, um, primarily in the coast ranges in the Central Valley. This one, um, coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, um, has slightly rounder leaves than the Wislazinii, the interior live oak. Um, and they become more like this. This is kind of a classic older leaf where they're um, leathery, round, and wide, unlike the interior live oak. Really nice big leaf maple here. And brilliant red bud blooming across the way not a super healthy one but I love seeing the color of the red buds this time of year they're so pretty um, and we're just gonna go to the end of this block and end our walk at the biggest blue oak maybe the biggest blue oak in town certainly the first one friends of trees planted I don't know of any bigger ones we planted this one that one uh, there was the one of the second ones we planted since been interplanted with a, a couple elms by a city contractor another elm over there here's a really pretty oh almost fell down blue oak with a nice form right here this is the old bijou theater let's hope it can come back 
We'll see, it's kind of controversial what's gonna happen to it, but I sure hope it makes it back. And then here is about eight years in the ground. Biggest blue oak I know of in town. Looking really, really good. We pruned it many times. Just does not want to go to a, a, a central leader or a very upright form. Very open, wide branching. This, these trees can get huge over time. Um, but you can see it's developing a really good trunk. Looks very healthy. This canopy's leafing out very full. Um, Quercus Douglasii. Well, thank you all very much for attending this tree walk. Um, we do have another one coming up at 3 o'clock. I'll be meeting folks again at the top of Spencer Butte. And we'll continue talking about climate change and looking at really vast areas from the beautiful view up there. Hope you're all having a good Earth Day and that we all commit to helping the Earth become more healthy. Thanks, everyone.